Good evening, saints and friends. My name is Sister Bernadette Stainrod, and on behalf of our pastor, uh, Brandon Davis, and the entire team, we welcome you to another Wednesday night Bible study. Tonight we'll be talking about God's great mercy, and truly our Father is great and greatly to be praised. Somebody this morning woke up, they're not here to see this evening, so we just thank God for his grace and his mercy that's given us another chance to come together in Bible study tonight. Another wonderful lesson. This lesson is the last lesson of the quarter. The overall theme has been Christ proclaims the kingdom, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful study. I've truly enjoyed it. And um, this week's lesson talking about God's great mercy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We give you praise tonight, Lord. We give you glory. We give you the honor for truly this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for this beautiful lesson. It's a lesson of introspection, Lord. We're not looking at our brother. We're not looking at our sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. God, have your way tonight. Open up our hearts to receive your word. Open up our ears to hear what you are saying. God, you're speaking to each one of us through these lessons, oh God, and just help us to see where we come short and, and fall short, God, and just ask for mercy. Have your way tonight. The blood of the lamb prevail, your blood against technical difficulties, God, and just give us a heart to receive what you are saying. And we thank you for anointed lesson tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray pray. Amen. This is a wonderful lesson. Um, as I stated, it's a lesson of introspection. I've going through this lesson. I just saw myself where, you know, I had to pray and ask God to help me, you know, areas in my life. And this lesson is talking about pride and humility. And from the onset, I just want to say that this is a lesson for all of us. There's something in it for all of us. And as we go forward in the lesson, we'll see pride is a problem that mankind has. You know, every one of us deals with pride on some level or another. And um, I will say this, a couple of um, weeks ago, I was speaking to someone and just to be transparent, I was speaking to someone and pride is something that the other person can see sometimes, but they may not see, you know? And I, as I was talking, they were asking me a question. And of course I, I said, I answered in humility, but inside I felt such pride. I was so proudful inside, the person couldn't tell. So I went, I said, Lord, forgive me. It was so ugly to my own self. So I know it offended the Lord and asked the Lord to forgive me. So as we go forward in the lesson, let's not look at our brother and our sister and say it's them and you, but Lord, it's me standing in the need of prayer. Amen. So lesson in review. Last week's lesson was the parable of the labors in the vineyard. It was God's gracious rewards. Um, and it was a parable of the labors in the vineyard. We learned that um, what we receive from God is due solely to his grace. The teaching of the Pharisees was that people could earn God's favor by their righteous deeds. Jesus's story demonstrated that God compensates people according to his own goodness, his own grace. God's ways are higher than our ways. There are many things that we may not understand, but we should remember that God is sovereign. You know, and we talked about he has supreme power and gracious. He's, God is sovereign and gracious. He is just and faithful in keeping his promises. 
He also is a gracious rewarder of those who put their trust in him. That was the overall um, review of last week's lesson. And this week we'll be coming from Luke chapter 18, God's great mercy. And I'm um, saints, I thank God for his mercy because it's of his mercy we are not consumed, amen. This chapter begins with two parables, the persistent widow and the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. I have here the overall theme in this chapter, chapter 18 is persistency, persistency, especially in prayer. Um, as we go forward to the verses, the, the, the verses in the lesson, I first want to look at um, the first verse. The, chap the lesson begins at nine, but I wanted to take a look at the first verse. And it reads, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Talking about persistency in prayer. And the English uh, Standard Version says, and he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. So we are regularly reminded of the importance of prayer in the life of every believer. We also regularly hear believers confess that they feel their prayer life is lacking. That is probably true of the majority of us. And as we heard that uh, beautiful word on Sunday um, from, Pastor, uh, from Pastor B just talking about the necessity of prayer, there's a need for prayer. But, you know, as he was saying, we all fall short in this area and it, it, we just have to, you know, press on in prayer. But there's an importance a need for prayer to, to keep us um, walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. So I don't know why my clicker is not working, but we'll go forward. So what is prayer? What is prayer? Can someone tell me please, what is prayer? Uh, Sister Gail. Prayer is really simply just talking to God, talking to Jesus. Uh, you know, you're praying to them. You're talking to them, not always asking for this, that, or the other, but it's also praising them. Yes. Anybody else would like to add? Uh, Brother Ashton. Brother Ashton. Conversation between you and God. I'm sorry? A conversation between you and God. A conversation between you and God. And I love that because in a conversation, there are two sides. You know, it's not just one person talking and no response. But in true prayer, you know, it's like we should get in a place of prayer where we pray and then we wait on God to respond. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay, the most basic definition of prayer is talking to God. All prayer must be offered in faith. Very important. Um, in the name of Jesus. And I'll read this and I'll get Brother Eddie. Prayer is the primary way for the believer in Jesus Christ to communicate his emotions and desires with God and to fellowship with him. There's many types of prayers. But this is the basic um, definition of prayer, is, is just to be in fellowship with him. As Pastor B was talking about at the feet of Jesus, just staying there in communion with him. We pray to praise God, thank him, adore him, tell him how much we love him. We pray to seek his guidance, ask for wisdom, make requests and tell him what is going on in our lives. He becomes a friend when you know him intimately. He cares what's going on in your life. We pray simply just to enjoy his presence. Amen. Brother Eddie? Yes, thank you. I was just going to add that, um, you know, in the process of, of communing with, with God, um, we're also building on our personal relationship with them, with him. So there's just another view. Thank you. 
Amen. It, it, you're building your personal relationship with him. It, 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 prayer is it's just like when you have a husband and wife. The more you communicate with each other, you get to know each other, you get to know each other's moods and dislikes and likes and, and, and you become intimate. You know, so, but if there's no communication, there's no intimacy because you don't know what that person is like. People live years with their spouse or, you know, have friends for years and really don't know them. They've never got intimate with them to know deep down, you know, what they like. You know, I, I remember years ago, I, I said to a, a friend, I thought she knew me and I said, you really don't know me, you know. So that's what happens. It's like, you know, people on the surface, but to get intimate with them, you have to spend time with them and to really get to know them. Any other comments? Okay. So after that definition, the basic definition of prayer, my next question is, as I read verse one, why do so many lose heart in prayer? Why do so many lose heart in prayer? Why do you lose heart in prayer? Uh, Sister Victoria. Um, I believe that a lot of times people think that their prayers are gonna get answered like, immediately. We think it's like a, a formula. For mm. example, like you pray right now and then you're gonna get exactly what you're praying for and you have the faith to see it now, but that doesn't always mean that it's gonna come right now. So I feel like that's why I've lost heart, you know, in early stages of my walk with Christ because I kind of thought, you know, I asked for it and I receive it, right? Why don't I get it now? <laughs> kind wow. of thing, so. Powerful. So thank you for sharing that. Brother Eddie, Sister Sharon. Thank you. I, I was also going to say, if I'm totally keeping it real, um, you know, sometimes being impatient or losing losing focus, mm. losing my personal focus on, you know, what I'm here to do and what my goal is. And that's to, you know, build on my personal relationship with God and try to please him. Amen. So um, I'll get the rest of the hands. Please don't hang up. Beautiful comments. And remember what Pastor B said. He, he, he made a comment and I don't remember exactly how he said it. I don't, I don't know if he remembers he wanted to just chime on, but chime in. So he said something to the effect that if we know it's good for us, why aren't we doing it? We, we know that, you know, it's almost like, you know, exercise is good for you. Why, why aren't you doing it? That kind of thing. So it's like we know all these things, but to do it, these are the things why we lose heart because lack of faith and persistency. You know, and I want to be real, like Brother Eddie said, let's get it out there so we could help each other and that we could be better Christians. Even this week, we see an elevation in our spiritual um, life, in our prayer life. Beautiful. Um, sisters, Brother Eddie, you wanted to add something else? Okay, Sister Sonia. No, thank you. I pass it. Sister Sonia and Sister Phoenicia. Also, so quickly from the time that we pray, it's circumstance happen. You can literally get off your knees and all of a sudden something happens that makes the situation look bleak. And it deters from that that moment of faith. Mm -hmm. Sister Phoenicia and uh, Sister Mary and Sister Janine. All transparency, I think something else that can keep us, that keeps us well, losing heart and faith. We, um, self-condemnation, sometimes we feel like if we mess up, we are not able to pray or sometimes we're trying to pray and we just can't get past our mistakes. So it keeps us from believing that he even hears us. Wow, these are beautiful comments. And we're making it real because it, it's applicable to all of us in some way or another. Uh, Sister Mary? And also the um, discouragement and warfare that comes with prayer. The, the more you pray, the more warfare you go into. And, you know, you just have to stay in the presence of God. So if we don't stay in the presence of God, if we don't keep reading our word, you know, we lose heart because we're not... Um, uh, what do you call it? Replenished. We re replenished in the presence of God. So the more there's more warfare, but basically. Sister Janine. Yeah, I was gonna say, like Sister Victoria said, um, because we don't get our prayers answered, but sometimes it's because we're not praying in accordance to the will of God. So we're praying so far fetched from what God's will is that 
you know, we lose heart. So it's asking God every day to give us the mind to pray his will or give us his mind so we can pray as well and have our prayers answered. You know, I, I really like that. I get these hands and um, the uh, Sister Sharon, uh, Sister Connie and Elder Leroy, and we'll move on from here. Um, mm -hmm. But I just want to say something to what um, Sister Janine was saying that we lose heart sometimes because we're not praying according to God's will. But then I love also too what Sister Mary was saying, it's a warfare. You know, so that's why it's really important that even we pray one for another. You know, we we pray for the saints, pray for our consecration. You know, it's it, it's not like we're in this battlefield by ourselves. It, we, we're all together and we have to really pray our strength in the Lord. So I just want, I needed to say that, if, especially if you see your brother or sister struggling, pray for them, you know, that we'd be strengthened in the Lord. Paul, I admonish that all the time, pray for me, you know, that the ministry could have free course of prayer is very, very essential in the lives of the believer and pray one for another. Okay, we'll get these and no more hands on this point. Sister Sharon, Sister Khan and Elder Leroy. So just quickly, I think sometimes when we're praying, we take on, you know, in our human mind, we 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 pretty much want to predict the way that God is going to answer our prayers. Mm -hmm. And then when he does not do it the way that we thought it should happen, he comes a, a completely different direction. But while he's doing it because, you know, he sees the bigger picture and making sure that, you know, everything is going to work out for our good. But in our human minds, we limit, we put the limit on God and thinking, oh, it's got to be answered this way because this is how I see it coming. And we, and we, we disappoint ourselves by not just fully trusting him to, to do it all completely. Amen. Sister Khan and Elder Leroy. Also, what happens to me, as uh, Pastor Brandon brought out on Sunday about Martha and Mary, sometimes I'm so anxious to pray and I have a lot of words and I want to get it out and I miss the point of what I'm doing or who I'm praying to and then I have to get really quiet and regroup and um just be still. Amen. Elder Leroy? Yeah, um, sometimes, sometimes we could pray the will of God and he doesn't answer right away because if you look at it, God is a visionary. If you look like in the book of Genesis, when God was making the heaven and the earth and so forth, he made light before he made man. So sometimes um, we're praying for things, it's God's will, but before he, the prayer is answered, you have to put certain things in place before it comes to you. So it doesn't mean God is not answering the prayer. You just have different steps before you give you the specific request that you have. So sometimes we pray the will of God and he doesn't give you right away. He put everything in order in order to answer your prayers. So it's a matter of just, you know, being patient and waiting on the Lord and getting his mind. Amen. So all of these factors, all the comments were beautiful, excellent comments. And all of these are factors why we lose heart in prayer. I also have here effective and constant praying is hard work. It requires discipline of the will and discipline of the flesh. We become discouraged and not always convinced of the reality of the power of prayer. These are in addition to all that we said. Obstacles, the weakness of the flesh and the enemy. We cannot remember, forget about the devil does not want us to pray. That's the main thing. The enemy get in the way of constant and effective praying. Um, uh, Sister Annalisa, please read the introduction for us. Our world is characterized by a great amount of corruption and degradation. While sin in general is at the heart of these problems, perhaps the sin of pride is the primary source of the corruption. Pride was the first sin in Isaiah 14 and 13, and continues to have a dominant influence in the world today. Our society is so full of pride that even we Christians may not recognize it in our lives. We may think it is normal. Pride is not just the problem of lawbreakers and immoral people. We Christians are prone to it as well. Our study today from Luke 18 will help us uncover the sin of pride in our lives. Amen. Thank you. And as I said, it's a, a lesson of introspection. And pride, I think, is the root of every sin to, that's common to man. I, I believe that. You know, it stems from pride. And, and to, uh, the lesson we have to, as we go through this lesson, 
let's see where we fall short and and we're, let's see where we're in need of help you know ask god to help us and strengthen the different areas of our lives so today's uh, aim facts to recognize pride as a primary source of sinful problems in the world today and the principle to even even in, in politics all in all area walk of life we see pride is the root of the sin the principle to examine our lives to find open and hidden instances of sin of i'm sorry of yes of sin but of pride there's things that are hidden as i was sharing that story i was talking to the person and i was shocked that as I was responding, I felt such a pride in my heart. I was, I was, in, I embarrassed my own self. I was like, Lord, forgive me if, you know, if, if I offended my own self, I know I offended you. So there's things that, and, and, and things sometimes we don't even know it's prideful and they, until the, the fire gets turned up on it, you know? So let's ask God tonight to examine our hearts, application to adapt a humble spirit in all areas of life. And the lesson outline, we're looking at Luke 18, verses 9 and 10, illustration by way of parable, two attitudes of prayer, Luke 18, 11 through 13, and application of the parable, Luke 18 and 4. And at this time, we'll have the scripture lesson um, text read. And he spake, and he spake parable this parable unto certain, certain which trusted, which trusted themselves, themselves that they were righteous. Could you stop that? There's an echo. Despot. Could you start that over for me, please? And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house, justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. Thank you, Brother Timothy. At this time, uh, we're going to watch a short video. Stories of the Bible, the parable of the Pharisee and tax collector. This is Jesus, hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love and healed people from their sickness. He did many miracles like walking on water. Oh, hey guys and even raised people from the dead. Uh, wahoo! One day, Jesus told this story to some people who thought they were very good and looked down on everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, hmm. and the other was a tax collector. Tax collectors were hated by many people. Yeah. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not bad like other people, cheaters and sinners. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. Ha <laughs> ha. I fast and give up eating food twice a week, and I give you a tenth of everything I earn. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest because he was so sad, saying, God, have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. Then Jesus said, I tell you, when the tax collector went home, he was right with God. But the Pharisee was not right with God. 
Everyone who makes himself great will be made humble, but everyone who makes himself humble will be made great. Amen. I wanted to give you a visual. That was so powerful. This, this, um, Stories of this lesson only has, I believe, six verses, but these verses, uh, you could preach a sermon on each verse, I think. It is so powerful. Um, first question. What did Jesus cover in the two parables he told? What did Jesus cover in the two parables he told? I think that was the, the question from the book, wasn't it? I think so. Any hands? Uh, Sister Mary. Uh, the lesson says um, he covered two parables. Um, the one, the first one that we read was about the prayer. You know, men ought always to pray, not faint. And the second one is the uh, lesson where he talks about the two people who went into the temple to pray, the Pharisee and the tax collector. Amen. I that was a good question. The lesson brought out because they 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 tie together. It says the first parable emphasized how important persistent prayer is, and that's why I talked about what is prayer. And, and, and to be persistent in prayer. And in the second, he contrasted the prayers of two people with entirely different attitudes. Taken together, they show us that the prayer life of a believer is most important, but that prayer per se can be ineffective if a person has a wrong attitude or a wrong motive. Who were the two personalities? We're building a foundation. Who were the two personalities Jesus used for his teaching in the second parable? Sister Gail. The two personalities, one was the uh, Pharisee and the other was a Republican. And um, you want me to tell what they are? No, I, I think I think I did that too, Sister Gail. I think you said re Republican, but it's a public. No, Republicans, <laughs> I'm sorry. They're public. Uh, he was a, a tax collector, a publican <laughs> that the Jews, the Jews hated because um, he had to go get the taxes from the Jews. You know, one of his own people. I'm sorry. Publicans. <laughs> Slip of the tongue. I, I, I did that too, though, I think. So, um, as she said, the Pharisee and the publicans both came to the temple to pray, one being a prominent spiritual leader of the community and the other one of the most hated individuals in the community. So, what do we know about these two sects? We, what do we know about the Pharisees and what do we know about the publicans? Let's talk about who they were. Let's talk about who they were. Who are the, who are the uh, let's talk about the Pharisees first. Who were the Pharisees? Um, Sister Gail, you want to add? Okay, unmute, please. Okay, Elder Leroy. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead, Sister Gail. Okay, the Pharisee, he, um, wait, let me get my notes. The Pharisee, he believed in, um, well, it means to separate one. And they believed in the oral tradition and the resurrection at the end time. And um, they also believed um, in the law of Moses. And did you say the publican also? Yeah, let's talk about the Pharisees first. We do. Oh, okay. Um, Elder Leary, you want to add to that? Yeah, they were, um, if you want to say, the interpreters of the law, and they were the religious hierarchy. And they would basically you know put a lot of burdens on the people because they were the one in charge and not only were, were the law they had also um traditions and they did this to keep the people in bondage and to be superior over them and they were basically doers but not I, i'm sorry they were sayers but not doers amen anybody else would like to add sister stephanie um, they also made up part of the Sanhedrin, so it was the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the minority, uh, I believe, in the, in the Sanhedrin. Sanhed I, I'm not saying it right. Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, yes. <laughs> Sanhedrin. Very good. So I have here, I'm, I'm going to read something, and then I'm going to have Sister Anna read a slide. So this may be repetitive, but 
I'll read what I have, but also for your visual, if you wanted to take notes. But I have here for the Pharisees, we're an inter influential religious sect within Judaism in the time of Christ and the early church. The word comes from a Hebrew word meaning separated. They were known for their emphasis on personal piety, their acceptance of oral traditions in addition to the written law, and their teaching that all Jews should observe all 600 plus laws in the Torah, in including the rituals concerning ceremonial purification. So they accepted the law of Moses and they're also law, but they were so they were so pious, you know, they said you have to keep all of the 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 law of Moses and also their um, traditional laws that they added on. The Pharisees were mostly middle class businessmen and leaders of the synagogue, though they were a minority in the Sanhedrin, as Sister Stephanie said, and held a minority number of positions as priests. They seemed to control the decision making of the Sanhedrin. Um, I'm sorry, they seem to control the decision making of the Sanhedrin because they had popular support among the people. So, um, Sister Annalisa, just read this, these two slides for us. As I said, some of these things are repetitive, but just so you can have a visual. The Pharisees were the most influential of all the Jewish religious sects of Jesus's day. The word Pharisee literally means the separated ones, separus which sums up the basic nature of their beliefs. They were the strictest, strictest legalists of the day who pledged themselves to obey and observe all the countless restrictive rules, traditions, and ceremonial laws of Orthodox Judaism. They considered themselves to be the only true followers of God's laws and therefore felt they were much better and holier than anyone else. Thus, they separated themselves not only from the non-Jews, whom they absolutely despised and considered pagan Gentile dogs, but they even set themselves above and apart from their own Jewish brethren. Amen. Thank you. So I wanted to show you what the Pharisee um, was. And so we're talking about the two men now both going up to the temple to pray. So uh, what is a publican? As Gail said, Republican, but a publican. What is the publican? Anybody else want to add? Uh, Sister Gail. Okay. Um, he was a Jewish tax collector. The um the Romans, he was collecting taxes for the Romans from his own people. And they told them that they could also get as much out of them as they wanted for themselves. So that's why they were so hated, because they were going against their own people, bringing their own people down. But that was one of the um, jobs that he got from the Romans. Amen. Anybody else want to add? I know there's more besides Sister Gail. Know more about the publicans. Do we know of anybody in uh, the New Testament who was a publican? Can somebody name uh, a New Testament character who was a publican? Sister Stephanie. Matthew. Very good. Is there another one? I'm thinking about another one also besides Matthew. Sister Merle. The kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Little Zacchaeus. Amen. I don't have a gift card for both of you, but <laughs> maybe next time. So publicans, the word publican comes from a Greek word meaning tax farmer. A publican had the job of collecting taxes. In the Roman world, publicans collected additional fees to pad their already extravagant salaries. In the Bible, Publicans were Jews who worked for the hated Roman government to collect taxes from Jewish citizens. They were hated. Publicans or tax collectors were despised in every culture. An invading government, I thought this was interesting, employed citizens of the conquered nation to do its dirty work, to do their dirty work. In order to entice men to betray their countrymen, officials promised hefty bonuses to publicans and allowed them to extort as much money from the citizens as they can get. My goodness, I found that from godquestions.org. 
So they were hated. It's like these publicans, you would say, they were in bed with the Roman government who the Jews hated, you know. So that, that was very interesting. So as before, I will have Sister Anna just read these two slides about the publicans, if you're taking notes. The publicans, on the other hand, were considered by their fellow Jews to be the absolutely worst kind of characters. For the publicans were tax collectors for the foreign occupier and ruler of Palestine, Imperial Rome. They were officially appointed Jewish tax collectors for Caesar and were therefore considered traitors by their brethren. The Romans would instruct the publicans how much taxes to collect from the people, and then the publicans could charge whatever they wanted, more than that for their own income. So they were usually extortioners, cheaters, and robbers of the Jews, and were therefore absolutely despised by their Jewish brethren who considered them the scum of the earth. Amen. So that may seem a little redundant, but I wanted to establish the contrast, the dichotomy of these two men. And the, the thing is, it's like there were two extremes, but what they were going up to the temple to do, both were going up to the temple to pray. And I think that was one of the, um, the next question. But um, Brother Ricky, please read this verse for us, these verses for us. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. My goodness. I highlighted trusted in themselves. And I wanted just to park here for a minute. And when I look at this phrase, trusted in themselves, all I could think about is the scripture that says um, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord. We cannot trust ourselves. There's nothing good in the flesh. Our hearts are desperately wicked. Who can know it? Um, Psalm 20, I'm sorry, Isaiah 64 and six says, but we are all as an unclean thing and all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. There is no good thing in the flesh, none righteous, no, not one. So that was the problem right there, that they trusted in themselves. This flesh will deceive you. You know, you would say, I will never do this. I will, I, that can't be me. We, we, we look down on others, and, but before long, we get in a place where we're doing the same thing, if not worse. So saints, we got to keep our eyes on the Lord. We got to keep pressing forward and, and have to go back to that message on Sunday. We have to stay at the feet of Jesus. We have to keep this flesh under subjection because this flesh will, will destroy us. We have, to, we have to keep this flesh mortified. The Bible says mortify the deeds of the flesh because this flesh will kill you. Any comments on this? Okay. So I just wanted to highlight it that, trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. When you despise others, you're looking down upon others. You know, we put ourselves in an elevated place. I didn't want to just glide by these two verses. As I said, verse nine in itself, you could preach a whole entire sermon on this. And um, we don't want to despise others. So as we're going through this lesson, let's really look at our hearts. You know, you people come to church and like, oh, my goodness, look at them. Or, you know, why they dress like that? You know, but this is the place for them to come. If they're in need, this is the place to come. We don't want to look down upon anybody and despise anybody in our hearts. Um, we're going to get married. I just want to read this one verse that I, I thought was so powerful. Romans 12 and 10 in the Amplified Bible reads, be devoted to one another with authentic brotherly affection as members of one family, give preference to the one another in honor. The Bible says, prefer your brother above you. And I wanted just to, to leave this thought with us that we cannot look down on anyone. We have to treat everybody in love and re respect because that person that right now may be down could be the one God will elevate and, and, and cause 
to, and, and God will cause them to bless you. So you don't know who people are, you know, um, Sister Mary. I was just thinking um, how Jesus is talking about prayer and these two attitudes are just the opposite of what we need to come to God with, trusting in God, not ourselves and not despising others, but loving others. Amen. We're going to get um, Brother Ashton and Mother Mill in all the hands, but I just wanted to share this. A couple of weeks ago, Lyra and I, we went, um, we went away, and while we were away, we went to a church uh, um, last Sunday. And the pastor there, he, he reminds me so much of Brother John, who's a Caucasian pastor, but he, he's, he's fiery, just like Brother John. Honestly, he even sounds like Brother John. So while we were away, though, he was saying, he, he had a testimony that he used to wear, he was he used to wear hippie and drugs and, 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 you know, back in the day he was on drugs and all type of thing. And so the lady in the church after church, she was telling us that she couldn't believe this young man who she knew grew up to be her pastor. You know, it, it's like, it's like she watched the transformation. And so she was just saying that you never know who people are, that you see him come in. He was a hippie and drugged out and stuff and God raised him up. And now he's the pastor of the church. So it's just powerful. You don't know who people are. So please don't look down on anybody and don't despise anybody. Prefer people above ourselves. Mother Millie, and I'm, I hope I'm not talking too much tonight, but this lesson really stirred my heart and just you know, do self-evaluation of my own heart. Um, Mother Millie and, um, oh no, I had Brother um, Ashton first. He had his hand up first, Brother Ashton. Unmute please. Okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Um, my apologies. I just wanted to say, because I, I live here in New York and I see a lot of um, homeless people on the streets when you're walking up and down the streets. And I know everyone has a backstory. And I just uh, remembered a, a story of a, a gentleman that was once a, um, a bum on the streets, but because of his addiction, his diction, not his addiction, but because of his diction, he was able to uh, become a broadcaster uh, when they discovered him on the streets. And just like you said, Sister Bernard, that you never know what people's backstories are or who they were as a people, so you can't look down on them. Amen. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mother Millie and Sister Alma. Um, Sister Bernard, that when I lived in New York, you know, passing out tracts, I noticed that a lot of people that had money and that had a lot of stuff you know, refused to even consider Jesus as their savior. But a lot of people that were in need, you know, grabbed the tracks and grabbed the tracks and, and read them. So the attitude of somebody that has a lot, sometimes they think they don't need God. But the ones that are doing without and needy, they have the attitude that, yes, I need help. Amen. Amen. Mr. Alma? Going back to the Pharisee when he was, you know, talking about himself and how he wasn't like the publican, one of the scriptures that came to my mind is Psalms 27 and 2, where it says, let another man praise thee, not thine own mouth, a stranger. Amen. So you. Amen. Thank you. Sister Myra. Go move on. Hey, Sister Bernie, I just had a quick comment that the Pharisees they were doing just as bad. They were taking from their people. They were robbing their people. And the tax collectors was doing the same thing. But the tax collector knew that he was doing wrong and wanted to repent for that. But the, the Pharisees looked at it as, I'm, I'm mightier than you. I'm better than you. And I can do what I want. And just to me, it was, you can't, can't see the sin that you were doing, but you can look at your brother and see the sin that he is doing and look down on him. And isn't that like people? Isn't that human nature? We could always see somebody else's failure. We could mm -hmm. always, please mute um, Brother Ashton. <laughs> we could always see somebody else's shortcoming, but uh, what the Bible says, we could see the, the, um, the beam 
I'm sorry, we could see the moat in somebody else's, in, in, in your brother, but you can't see the beam that's in, in your heart. But that's how it is. But Lord, help us tonight. Um, the question here, what was their purpose in going to temple? As we stated, their purpose was to pray. Two men went to pray. Same place, same time, went up to the temple to pray. God promised King Solomon that whatever prayer was made in, the right, in, in that right manner, towards that house would be accepted. But as we clearly see that that Pharisee's prayer was not accepted. And we're going to talk about that in, in a few minutes. So even before we read the Pharisee's prayer, what two things do we observe that indicate pride in, in his life? Before we actually read the prayer, what two things um, do we in, we see as an indication of his pride? Sister Victoria. He begins and pretty much says everything like in I statements, like I'm so good. I, I'm better than these people. I'm a better prayer. I'm look like he focuses on himself versus on focusing on God and coming into prayer with like thankfulness. He looks at himself instead. Good. And we're going to talk about that a, a little further, a little more, but what was his posture? Let's look at that first before we actually go into what he says. Um, let's look at his posture. Um, Sister Diane. Unmute, please. Okay, Brother Ricky. Uh, yes, he uh, he didn't even get in nail. He wasn't in a humble state. The scripture says that he stood and prayed. Um, so, you know, you know, we know that when you kneel, that's, you know, just a sign of just you know, you're just surrendering to God. So that just was one side, one visible sign of uh, just his pride. And then, like Sister Victoria said, he was just, he pretty much, he was thanking God that he wasn't like everybody else. Okay, so I want to just, just clarify this, tweak this a little bit. There's nothing wrong with standing to pray. There's nothing, because we, even we, we do it here. But where he stood was, it was for all to see. He, he stood, you know, in proudfulness, but they, they believe where he stood in the temple was for all to see him. It was a show. So it wasn't just him standing. It's the posture in which he, he stood, you know, for all to see. And I read something they were saying it was, there were different areas in, in, in the temple. So no doubt, you know, first, first of all, the closer you get to the, uh, um, the inner courts, the, the holier you would be, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure where in the temple he prayed, but more than likely it's for all to see him uh, uh, praying. Elder Rumble. Uh, yeah, I want to read this. And this is uh, First Corinthians uh, chapter 10 and verse 12. And this is what it says. It, uh, this is in the Living Bible. It says, so be careful if you are thinking, oh, I'll never behave like that. Let this be a warning to you, for you too may fall into sin. And what happened is I've seen over the years where people was criticizing other people because of their shortcomings and things. I mean, I've, I've seen it for years. I would never do that. I'll never this and never that. But the scripture said, be careful because you too, you know, can fall into sin. And I've seen that happen so many times, you know, like over the, you know, just since I've been saved. And, you know, strong people have fallen. And, but it, it's like that we should never be in a self righteous place where we look down upon somebody else. And this is, it is it's really amazing because last night I had this dream. And I'm telling you, I, I, I could not believe that it's like the grace of God and the mercy of God. It's like God was, it's like he was going looking for people. Hold on. It, it was like he was going looking for people who, who like real hardcore criminals, people who had committed murder. And and I mean, the, almost like the worst people that we would consider in, 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 our, in our society. The grace of God was seeking for these kinds of people to bring them out of sin. And it's like last night I saw God's mercy and his grace in such a powerful way. It, it's like I, I, he was looking for these people. He was searching for them because he wanted to have mercy 
upon these people to bring them into the kingdom of heaven. So sometimes we may look down on them, but like just like we mentioned, um, the uh, 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 Zacchaeus and 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 even the Matthew, you know, God br grace brought them into the kingdom of heaven. So it's a, it's a, it's a very important thing that we do as Christian. Never ever look down on any individual no matter what stage of life they're in because the the the, the point that sister um uh, um um uh, um um Pinea's mother um Myra sister Myra the, the point that sister Myra brought out is very good because the Pharisees you got to remember now they're the one that gave the money to crucify you know to Judas you know what I'm saying so so these people they they could see all the sin in somebody else but in their own self they didn't realize what they were doing was also a, a, a sinful thing amen amen and thank you for sharing the elder rumble and even that dream the the scripture says the lord is long suffering you know not uh, not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance and it goes back to the question we asked in the beginning sometimes our, our prayers seem delayed but it, i love what even elder leroy said god is setting the stage you know that had he done this then i might have been left out you know but he's long suffering because he doesn't want any to perish but all should come to repentance so you know had had um you know maybe uh, we've been praying for a long time for revival for our, um, you know, Elder Stevens. And but had he done it, maybe you might have been left out, or I might have been left out. But he wants to include us, and he goes searching to and fro to you. So who can I save? Who can I deliver? That is so powerful. So let's open up our hearts, even to what Elder Rumble said about that dream. As we walk to and fro, you know, let's say a loving thing to that uh, bum on the street, as Brother Ashton said. You know, that one that seems like so run down and stepped over, and you know, people don't even acknowledge them. But that God can save that person, and that person can end up one day to be your pastor. Uh, that's so powerful. I'm telling you, what a powerful lesson. Thank you all. For your comments elder leroy i was thinking about um in zachariah where it was said the priest was standing before god and satan was accused you know the, the um tax collector the, the tax collector the publican he knew already that based on society and the job that he had that he was despised now here this man went up to church to pray and in the midst of god's presence somebody accusing him i mean how worse can you feel you go to humble yourself before god and somebody on your finger or even this tax collector he, you know he's a horrible you know this man could have like oh my god just take me out of here you know but you know uh, god is so gracious it's not like man but you know elder Leroy, it's just like i said though you know we 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 look at the the pharisee and we we look at this story but we do it also in church we become the, we have the pharisee look I can't say that we could become Pharisees. We have that spirit. You know, people come to church and we look down upon them and look at them. Why do they come to church like that? You know, you're coming to church, and you know, but that's where, that's where they should come, you know, to seek help, you know, you know, if they had it all together, they wouldn't come to church. So Lord help us not to have that Pharisaical spirit. You know, the word I'm trying to say, amen, but Lord help us. So the first sign of, of this man full of pride is how he stood in, in view of all the people to see him pray, you know, with his garb. And another point was the Pharisee prayed within himself. He wasn't speaking to God, but the focus was only on himself. So that, that was also important. He, was, he went there. He wasn't speaking um, to God. He was trying to impress God. So from that story, we see we see the pride. So Brother Ricky, can you please read these two verses for us? The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Thank you. So how did the Pharisee view himself and what was his standard of comparison that led him to these conclusions? Any hands? How did he view himself? And what was his standard of comparison that led him to these conclusions? This is a lesson in the book. Uh, Sister Mary and Sister Annalisa. 
um, he viewed himself as not like other men. In other words, he was better than other people and he was comparing himself with others. You know, ex he said he was not an extortioner, an unjust adulterer, or even as this publican. So he was looking down on other people and he put himself on a pedestal uh, instead of comparing himself to God. Excellent point. Instead of comparing himself to God, that's the standard. Sister Annalise and Sister Merle. To add to what Sister Mary said, um, uh, I think it was said, but he didn't go to pray. He went to talk about himself. And I think in that, that verse alone, he mentioned I five times. So he was praising himself. And one point that, you know, was always told to me is that when you compare or deflect what's wrong with someone else, mm. you're basically just saying what's wrong with you. Wow. Um, that you don't want people to see. And my father used to say that, um, if you have a problem trusting everyone, that's because you really don't trust yourself. Mm -hmm. And then when he used to get on me for stuff, he used to say, and if I'm always getting defensive, it must mean that I'm guilty of something. So it's important that, you know, when we're deflecting that we first take inventory, you know, the word says to work out our salvation for ourselves. Wow. Powerful. Sister Merle? They've said it. Okay. Any other comment? He thanked God. Oh, Sister Mary. I just wanted to say also, when you ask that question, what prayer is, this is also an example of what prayer is not. It's not telling God how good you are and how bad others are. And that's what the Pharisee was doing. Excellent point. He thanked God that he was not like other men. What a prayer. I am not like Leroy. <laughs> He's my husband, so I'm just using that as an example. You know, sometimes we tease each other, you know, around the house. We do religious things like that. I'm so glad, you know, I'm not like you, things like that. But we're joking, we're jesting. But he, this man was serious. And when you compare yourself to others, either you're going to be proudful or you're going to debase yourself. There, it's like there's no middle ground. Your, your, your comparison is off kilter. It, it, you will not have the correct view. As Sister, um, I think it was Anna, Anna said, you, you have to compare yourself, or Sister Mary, you have to peer, compare yourself to God, God's standard. He thanked God that he was not like other men. Uh, Brother Ashton? Unmute, Mr. Byrne, could I share this? Um, there's a couple of things I wanted to share uh, sure. regarding the lesson. Um, it says the uh, characteristics, characteristics of the proud. Uh, it says the proud people make themselves of uh, the focus. Proud people compare themselves to others and flaunt their accomplishments. Proud people put others down to try and elevate their own status. Proud people will be humbled. Wow. Thank you. Beautiful. He thanked God that he was not like other men. He immediately put all those who were not of his social and religious class in the category of inferiority and quickly made a specific contrast with the tax collector. His attitude was that he was better than most other people and he justified it by mentioning some of the people considered to be the most ungodly people in society extortioners, the unjust and adulterers. That's from the Bible Expositor. While he said he thanked God, there's really no element of praise to God in his prayer. The Pharisee praised himself. It isn't hard to have such a high position, opinion of self when you compare yourself to other people. Oftentimes you will find someone worse. How did the Pharisee emphasize how he viewed his religious activities? Uh, Pastor B. Yeah, I just wanted to say, Sister Bernie, um, as you were just saying that that, that, that last question real quick, um, that, it, that brought to mind Romans chapter 3, where it says, um, there's none righteous, no, not one. Um, and you guys pretty much made the point, but I just think it's um, really important because I think a lot of times we get um, and myself as well, we'll start to look at other people 
and start to see them or say, oh, well, they did this and nothing happened, and, you know, or they got away with something. And so you, we start to judge ourselves based on, well, they're in the worst state and I could be like them. I caught myself doing it a couple of weeks ago. I was, I was praying and I was saying, God, I thank you that I'm not um, where I used to be or, or, or where I could be. And it was, but the way it was, I was praying, it didn't feel right because it was almost like, yeah, but still, there's be you can do better. So don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Um, and then the other scripture I just wanted to say that came to mind is that we should live a life, especially as leaders, and we're all leaders in our own respect uh, perspectives, but we should live a life where we're above reproach that people can look on us and they don't have to even, you know, uh, think that way of, you know, well, they're doing it. And, you know, that, you know, so um, I thought about when Paul told Timothy, uh, when Paul wrote in Philippians, when he said that, you know, the things that you both learned and received and heard and seen in me do those things. So I just think it's something awesome where we can live a life where it, we're so um, fixed in God that people can look on us and we can have the confidence to say, look on us and do what we do. So that was it. Amen. Excellent comment. Thank you for sharing that. Um, how did the Pharisee emphasize how he viewed his religious activities? He pointed out specific areas in which he considered himself to be faithful in religious practice, as, Minister, as Pastor B just said. He faithfully fasted twice a week. Look, I'm fasting twice a week. They're, I know they're not fasting, you know, all those things. And he diligently tied on everything. The problem in, in his doing of such things was that they were done with the wrong attitude and served only to increase his personal sense of pride. So I thought this, this expositor this week had excellent commentary. I read in the uh, Enduring Word, um, he says, many Jews fasted. This is very interesting now, listen to this. He said, many Jews fasted on the second and fifth days of the week because they believed that Moses went up on Mount Sinai to receive the law on the fifth day of the week and that he came down with the law on the second day of the week. Those who wished to gain special merit fasted also on Mondays and Thursdays. It is not, it, I'm sorry, it is noteworthy that these were the market days when Jerusalem was full of people. Those who fasted whitened their faces and appeared in deceived clothes, and those days gave their piety, and those days gave their piety the biggest audience. So as we brought out the point of when the Pharisee went in the temple, his posture, he stood for all to see him. So the Pharisees, they, they were all about show. They were all about impressing, you know, their fellow Jews. So all this now was for their glory, not for the glory of God. So you think you're fasting two days, but that's why Jesus says, when you fast, don't appear to men to fast. Don't be, you know, like have your head down. And But they had white um whitened faces so as they go through the marketplace all could see they were fasting and that's here are the pious pharisees i thought that was very interesting any comments brother curtis yes um that's interesting that he talked about fasting because fasting is to humble yourself before the lord for the sins that you have committed yes. and so he didn't even fast in the right spirit I mean, that's an excellent point to bring up, Brother Curtis. So we too, you know, when we fast, you know, we're not fasting for competition to say, you know, I went five days and you went only two. It's with the heart. You could do one day or even a half a day and consecrate that holy to the Lord and you get more accomplished, you know, and it's humbling of the flesh of your soul. Sister Mary. And also I can imagine he was praying loudly so people can hear him because they love to justify themselves, not just before God, but before men. So I can just imagine him making this loud prayer so everybody knew how pious he was. You know, and the, the video I showed, I love that video. It was a little cartoon. And in it, I don't know if you saw it, when the Pharisee was praying, it's like he did his eye like that to see who was looking. <laughs> to see he was looking at him. I thought that was so cute. But that's what I believe, Sister May, he was praying and was like, who's lo looking around? You know, sometimes our children do it in church. You know, it's like they know church. So sometimes they're praising the Lord, but then they start looking to see who's watching them <laughs> praise the Lord, you know. So I really believe this is what this Pharisee was doing. But I, I love the point Sister Anna brought out. 
It says here, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all I possess. And she brought out the point where in such a short prayer, the Pharisee repeated the word I five times in such a short prayer. I, it's me, 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 me. All of his statements were punctuated with the word I, for that in reality was what his life was all about. Him, he was proud of himself and expected others to share in his exalted self-assessment. Powerful. You can imagine, as Sister Mary was saying, his haughty look at, and the pride that beat within his chest. He wasn't like this publican that sold out his nation. He was saying, I'm not like this publican who's, who's in bed with Rome, who sold out his nation. He reminded God of the religious things he had done. He had gone well beyond the requirements of the law. Any comments? Mother Millie. In Isaiah 14, Lucifer was saying, I, I, I also. Pride. Pride, pride. And, you know, beware of people every time they talk about themselves is I, 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 I. I mean, I've actually spoken to people and, you know, in conversation with people and even just trying to share something. And before I could even share, they turn the conversation around and it's all about I, I, I. I don't mean, I don't mean, you know, people in here. I'm just people out there, you know. And it's all about I, Brother Curtis and Sister Merle. Yeah, I just wanted to say um, when the devil said I, it was five, two, five times he said it. I'm sorry, repeat that? Repeat what you said, Brother Curtis? Yeah, the devil, when the devil spoke in I, he spoke five times too, like the Pharisee. When, when, what are you referring to, Brother Curtis? When he spoke I, what, what, what are you referring to? When the devil was standing before the Lord and he said, I will exalt my throne above the clouds of the north. I will be like the most high. Um, five times, yeah. Oh, do you have a scripture text for that? So we could just leave with the people because I'm, I, you know, I can't. Can you, you have a scripture text? Okay, I'll come back with it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Sister Merle? Um, I've, I've shared this before, but I heard someone say one time, I hope I get this right. Pride is the only sickness that someone can have that affects everyone around them, but it, but it doesn't directly. But it, but they don't feel the effects of it. Meaning that when someone's prideful, everybody else around them can see the pride, can feel the pride, is sick of the pride. But that person walks around with that proud, with that pride. So like you know, like they're just. Ex they're haughty with it and exalted by it and everybody else is affected by it mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. makes sense yes brother curtis you have a scripture yes isaiah 14 and 12 it says how art thou fallen from what? heaven of lucifer yeah. what verses isaiah 14 and what verses in, in 12 12 oh, 14 okay. and 12. okay you read that please can you read that please yes it says how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Beautiful. Thank you. So it's good when we share things like that. We just have this scripture text to, you know, back up what we're saying. But that's powerful, Brother Curtis. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mother Millie? No, I was looking at the same thing when I first said that was Satan. Very right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. So, oh, and, and to go back to even what Sister Merle said, and we're going to have Brother Ricky read this verse for us. As I, as I stated before, the way pride works, though, pride can also be subtle. So sometimes you could see the pride and sometimes you cannot because only God sees the heart. You could say something so humble 
and appear so humble, but inside you're, you're puffed up and haughty. So it, it's like God is the cerner of the, the heart, you know? And, and intents of the heart. He sees the intent and the, the motive and, you know, your attitude and he goes deep within. So we can try to fool people, but people of God, saints and friends, we cannot fool God. And we all have to put our hearts on the altar and ask God to cleanse us and wash us in the precious blood of Jesus. Amen. So brother Ricky, read this for us, please. And the publican, standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven but smote upon his breast saying god be merciful to me a sinner mm -hmm. so what did the publican do to reveal a sense of unworthiness sister carol purdue what the publican did he came uh, um pharisee because he felt unworthy to be in the presence of God and the spiritual leader and he thought that he was less than the leader not knowing or realizing that he was more spiritual than the Pharisee himself amen you beeped out a little bit um sister Gail sister Gail you want to ask um he, and it said and he stood afar off he didn't go up like the Pharisee did but he stood afar off and then he he also um the show um sincere humility he started beating on his chest and he wouldn't even lift his eyes to show that he was he had genuine humility and he really wanted God's mercy and he was really sorry for what he had to do. That's how I looked at it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. He stood and beat his chest. So he stood afar off, but he also beat his chest, an indication of his recognition of the enormity of his sin and that it was keeping him at a distance from his God. Amen. And I read where it says that verb means it was an habitual um, action. So it wasn't just once. He just kept, Lord, have, oh, I have a mic. But it was like, Lord, have mercy, have mercy, you know, like deep grief, deep mourning. It was an expression of his deep and sincere condition. Elder Leroy? Yeah, this man also, he saw the, the awfulness of his sin. And uh, I, I believe he saw it the way God did, you know, like uh, Jer, um Isaiah, when he had the, the encounter with the Lord, he said, woe is me. And, um, you know, the, the brokenness that it, 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 it allows to happen, you can't help but weep before the Lord. You know, in, in some of the revival books I read, people be praying and, you know, like this young man, when the condition of God hit him, he was so sorry and appalled about his sin. He was saying, God, have mercy. He said, hell is still good for me. As bad as hell is, he looked at his sin and he said, hell is still good for me. Lord, have mercy. You know, so, you know, this man really had, you know, the, 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 the dread and the fear of God upon him. That's why he couldn't look up. Amen. So you went right into our next question. What was his prayer request? And um, this is very important because when you really, and you remember now, they were in the temple. This is where, you know, they should meet God. This is where you should be closer to God. But yet this Pharisee, you know, he was comparing himself to others, but the mirror we have to look you know, in the word of God and compare ourselves to God's standard. And when we do that, just like Elder Leroy said, we're going to be like Isaiah, woe is me, Lord. I'm undone. The closer we get to the holiness of God, the more we will see our, our, our flesh, the more we will see flesh, we'll see our sin. You know, and, and, and what happened is the more you draw close to the Lord, it becomes a light. He illuminates the things in you that you didn't even see before. The light is turned on into the crevices of our innermost being that you're like, oh my God, Lord, I didn't know that was there. Oh my goodness, I didn't know I had this in my heart. And the closer we get to that light, the light will shine brighter and we'll see more of our unworthiness. But this man cried out, have mercy, oh God, I'm a sinner. So I, I love what Elder Leroy said about Isaiah. Woe is me, Lord. And like the Pharisee, the publican standard of comparison was God instead of people. Important. Let me re uh, repeat that. Unlike the Pharisee, the publican standard of comparison was God instead of people. We have to stop comparing ourselves to people. We have to stop comparing ourselves to our brother and our sister. But we have to take this Bible, read it, let it be a reflection of our sins and cry for mercy. Any hands? Any thoughts? Sister Victoria. 
I just thought as we're kind of like digging deeper to this tax collector, I just wonder the sense of remorse he must have. Like, you know, he's probably well aware that the job that he has is not a righteous job. I just wonder, like, just this is me just thinking outside of the box. Like, I wonder if he knows he's doing wrong and that's like just the only thing that he can do to, you know, provide for his family. I just wonder like his inner thoughts sometimes, like, because he obviously noticed himself as a sinner. He didn't say, oh, look at me with this righteous job. Like, I feel like them mentioning he was a tax collector kind of taps into how he views himself as well. I don't know. I just, that was just a thought that I had while you guys were speaking. Yeah, that that's a, a, a nice thought, you know, because I, I was the same, I was thinking the same thing, but I reflected back on um, Zacchaeus. You know, he was a publican, and when he encountered Christ, you know, and I know it was a different tax collector, but when he encountered Christ, I think it's in maybe Luke 19, I think, I believe, that he all, all, he offered to pay restitution. You know, he said, Christ, I give you fourfold. I'll return the money, you know, four times to all those people I robbed. So I think true repentance, Sister Victoria, causes you to, to do restitution, you, you know, or um, those people you robbed or those people you have wronged. When you truly repent, there's a response. You can't repent and you know you've wronged people, you've robbed people, but it, it brings about a, a restitution, a repentance, but also you, you try to correct the wrongs that were done. So I really believe after he met Jesus, have mercy, Lord, upon me, a sinner. I think he probably did what Zacchaeus did, might have done. Uh, Sister Shirley and Sister Merle, Elder Leroy. Yes, um, what I, I was just going to comment on where it says, um, you said about comparing yourself to God instead of other people. Mm -hmm. It says this gave him a more re realistic evaluation because sometimes, you know, when you compare yourself to people, then you think you're all right. But then when you compare yourself to God, then you see, you know, how far you, you have to go, you know. So that's what I wanted to say. Amen. Um, Sister Merle and Elder Leroy. Um, because of what Sister Vicky was saying, I was thinking about this publican and I was thinking, wow, you know, this publican that is hated by all the Jews, but he still made his way to the temple to pray. Even though he had this job that everyone hated, he knew everyone hated, but in the midst of that, he was like, you know what? It's time to go to the temple to pray. And he still went into the temple. He still went in to pray. And then in the midst of him having this terrible job, he still had this prayer of total humility. So I just found that so, it like, I just found that so interesting as I thought about this publican, but I, I just wanted to share that. And I probably wouldn't have shared it, but it's, Sister Victoria was talking about that. It just made me say, well, I just want to share that. But I just found that so amazing. That's that's stirring, Sister Merle. I'm going to get these two hands and we have to move on. I don't want to run out of time. But that is so stirring because I even thought about, I don't want to uh, deviate too much, but I thought about even um, Elder Stevens' testimony. You know, he would do, he was going to commit a sin and then ask God to forgive him. But all I could see, Sister Merle, is that this man was brought up knowing God and he knew he was doing wrong. So, you know, let me go and just ask God for mercy. You know, and that's how I can see you train up your kids. And I'm telling you, and it's in them. And they, when they're doing wrong, they will still ask God for mercy. So at, at one time or another, as we see in this story, the story doesn't go on to tell us what became of this publican. But I am convinced later on that from Jesus's response that this man fell in love with Jesus, fell in love with God and forsook his wicked ways. Uh, no more hands after this. I mean, on this point, Elder Lira and Sister Mary, but excellent, Sister Merle. That's that's stirring. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, um, being a tax collector, it, it wasn't a bad job, or it, it was just the the thievery and the robbery that take place. I mean, you have to pay tax like the IRS does today. So he had an honorable job because he was representing Rome. But the problem was they were um, charging, you know, excess and robbing the people, and that's where the sin came in. Not doing the job that he was hired by Rome to do because you need revenues to run the state. 
Yes, so I agree with that. But at the the flip side, remember though, they the Jer people of Jerusalem hated them because they they felt they were traitors to their their um their their um nation. You know, they they hated the tax collectors. They hated the publicans because they felt they were in bed with Rome. They were traitors. You know, and they were despised. So to him to go to that temple, like Merle said to even pray, knowing everybody there hates you. Something had to be in him, you know, and no doubt he was ripping off the people. So there was some conviction that God was dealing with this man. Beautiful comments. Um, the last hand was, I think it was Sister Mary, I think. No, I'm good, thanks. Okay. So beautiful comments. Thank you all for sharing. So um, Sister Annalisa, just read this for us. So he says, um, what was his prayer that was, his prayer was for God to have mercy on him because he was a sinner. And I just thinking like blind Bartimaeus, Lord, have mercy upon me, you know, because they, these people realize they, they're, they got close to Jesus and they feel their unworthiness that them being a sinner, God have mercy. Um, Sister Anna, read this for us real quick. The ancient Greek word translated to be merciful is hylaskomai. It is actually the word for an atoning sacrifice. The fullest sense of what the tax collector said was, God be merciful to me through your atoning sacrifice for sins, because I am a sinner. The only other place this word is used in the New Testament is in Hebrews 2 and 17, where it is translated propitiation. In the original Greek, the words are even fewer than in English. Oh, that men would learn to pray with less of language and more of meaning. What great things are packed away in this short petition? God, mercy, sin, the propitiation, and forgiveness. Amen. I thought that was so good. So his mercy was begging God to atone for his sins. So he was aware of what he was doing was wrong. As Sister Merle was saying, ripping off the people. So as Elder Lira was saying, the profession in itself, you know, it was... Um, you know, he it was an upright thing that he was doing for Rome, but when they start ripping off the people, you know, the extortion and, and all these things, that's where the problem came in. Okay, so Brother Ricky, read this last verse for us, please. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen. So for time's sake, um, what did Jesus declare about him and the Pharisee? What did Jesus declare about him and the Pharisee? Any hands we have not heard from tonight? Sister Shirley, go ahead. Go ahead, Sister Shirley. Unmute. Okay. I'm sorry. Jesus said that he went home more justified than the other guy, that the other the, the Pharisee. Amen. It, it was the publican who went home justified in God's eyes, not the Pharisee, the religious leader. The Pharisee was deluded about the publican who was also in the temple praying. He thought the publican was a great sinner, but he went home justified by God while the proud Pharisee went home only self-satisfied. I read that in a commentary. I thought that was so powerful. He went home justified by God while the proud Pharisee went home only self-satisfied. What does it mean that a person is justified? We're wrapping it up, Sister Mary. I'm I'm sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to raise my hand, sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what does it mean for a person to be justified, Sister Annalisa? Um, it means that um, you're being declared righteous and you're innocent of all charges. And I read a comment, uh, commentary that I thought was pretty powerful for this verse. It said, the justification of the tax collector was immediate. He humbly came to God on the basis of his atoning sacrifice and was justified. He didn't earn his justification and he didn't have a probationary period. Mm. He was simply justified. Amen. Powerful. And the scripture say the scripture says, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Last question. Uh, what principle did Jesus state in Luke 18 and 14 about how God deals with his people? Very important. Very important question. Sister Anna or Mother Millie? 
God brings down those who are proud, but extols those who are gently, genuinely humble. Amen. God. Proverbs 3, Proverbs 3, 34. Amen. Very important. He brings down those who are proud, but exalts those who are genuinely humble. And this is the takeaway tonight. Those who are genuinely humble. And I have a, a few scriptures here for our takeaway. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. Proverbs 29 and 23. It says here, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 11 and 2. Surely he scorneth the scorners, but he giveth grace unto the lowly. Proverbs 3 and 34. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16 and 18. God resisteth the proud, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. And we need to get under what, what, wherever God is given grace, that's where we need to be. We need more grace and favor upon our lives. So whatever we have to do to get more grace from God, that's what we must do. And that is humility. That is to humble ourselves under the hands of God. Mother Millie, you had your hand up? Okay. And so any comments before we conclude? Okay. Uh, Sister Mary? I just wanted to say I love um, what Brother Curtis has brought, had brought out about the Lucifer, because um, the Jesus had called the, the Pharisees, you know, he said, your father is the devil. Wow. So these, yeah, their, their character, everything they did, they were just mirroring the devil. So I, it brought it more home when he brought out those scriptures. Wow, powerful point, uh, Sister Mary. And Brother Curtis, that was also powerful. Thank you for sharing that. So in conclusion, our study today has shown us clear examples of pride and humility. And as stated when we, as I stated before, this was a lesson of introspection. You know, we all fall short. We could all see areas where we need to come up. We need to improve. We need to repent, you know, and ask God to help us in these areas. All of us, none of us are exempt. Fighting and I am better attitude is a lifetime struggle, as Pastor B brought out. You know, we it's a struggle, you know, because you always see somebody's worse off than you, you know, and then you always see somebody better than you. But fighting and I am at I am better attitude is a lifetime struggle. Let us examine our lives daily to see where we still harbor that attitude and move away from it. May we always strive to exhibit an attitude of humbleness as a testimony of our Christian faith. It is those who come to God recognizing their spiritual poverty will find acceptance, forgiveness, and eternal life. As the publican came to Christ, woe is me, have mercy upon me, Lord. It's those that will come to Christ um, will find acceptance, forgiveness, and eternal life. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. May the scripture be planted deep into our hearts, lest we be deceived and remain unforgiven, while the poor, humble, penitent, penitent inherit eternal life. And I just, our lesson tonight was God's great mercy, God's great mercy. And I go back to Elder um, Rumble's dream last night that was so powerful. And I really believe this is where God wants us to leave this lesson tonight, that God is merciful. He's not willing that any should uh, uh, um, perish, but all should come to repentance. But this scripture I love, I read it often. It says Psalm 103, 8 through 13. He says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. His mercy is everlasting. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as for as the heaven is high above the earth, for as the heaven is high above the earth, 
so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. Amen. As I stated, this is the last lesson of the quarter. And um, next week will be, next week begins a new quarter and a new unit of study on success and failure. To be successful in serving Christ, we must strive to be faithful in our obedience to him. Disobedience brings only failure. And the lesson is titled, Be Strong and Courageous, coming from Joshua, the first chapter. Thank you so much this evening for your participation. I pray you got something out of the lesson and that we'll leave this place better Christians and trying to uh, aim to please our Father which is in heaven. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Amen. God bless you. Have a great evening.